Good evening. It's Tuesday. It's eight o'clock, and it's time for Raconteurs News. Hope you've all had a fantastic week and really enjoyed the. Uh, well, if you're in the UK, you've enjoyed our recent um, pleasantly warm spell, which has been referred to as the hottest heat wave since uh, the Earth cooled down at the beginning of the solar system. But uh, you know, it it was. A week of warm days, and now I'm looking out the window, it's nearly dark, and it's chucking it down with rain, which it has been doing all day. So, uh, I hope you made the most of it, and uh, kind of girding yourself, ready for winter, because it's nearing July now, and winter usually starts early July in uh, in this country, so we'll... Um, we were expecting to have Dr. Nick Collistrum on tonight, but um, we've been communicating backwards and forwards, and Jason and I have been uh, had a reading heads on to, to get read his book ready for tonight, but unfortunately Nick hasn't showed up, so hopefully he might show up uh, in a few minutes, but uh, if not, Jason and I have got a few things to talk about. But what, you, what sort of a week have you had, Jason? Yeah, it's been okay. I mean, we had uh, we had the good week, uh, the good weather last week, <clears throat> and um, then of course uh, that that brought all the witches out, and now the rains come along so that they can get wet, and they can all be I'm melting, I'm melting. <laughs> so uh, who knows what's who knows what's going on? It's it's a crazy, crazy world we live in. Oh and, yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And it's uh, yeah. I'm well. I'll just call myself Captain Cliche for tonight. I'll I'll, I'll be taking over AD's role. Yeah. Anybody who missed the show we did last night with uh, Rob Halford, um, if you like your um, non-mainstream history and uh, you've got a bit of uh, passing or a keen interest on Scandinavia, there's a hell of a lot of information to digest in there for you. And Rob gives a load of links, so you can look it all up on Google as you're listening. Um, I thought a thoroughly fascinating show. Well done to Rob and Aid for last night. That was cracking. But funny enough, I, would, um, I don't always get a chance to listen to Chuck O'Chelly because we're often preparing for other shows when Chuck's on. But uh, I did manage to catch a bit of his show today, and uh, I got quite a present surprise. He got... Um, Lee Mack on there, yeah, not not the British comedian, the uh, the guy who's on RT, the comedy guy. Have you seen him? Uh, no, I've not. No, no, you're doing lightness. Yeah, he's he's a, a young American guy. He's he's got a very um, satirical take on the news, and uh, he's got. Uh, I can't remember what his, his show's called on RTs. He has quite a rant about an awful lot of things and uh, similar sort of vein to Max Kaiser, but not kind of uh, so tightly focused on the financial side of things. Uh, it was an interesting show. I mean, Chuck's getting some fabulous guests on lately. Yeah, I heard a bit of Chuck's uh, show last night before Aidy's show, um, Raconteurs 2, which was on... Um, it's on 7 till 9 on a Monday on... RaconteursNews.com and of course on AutonomousMedia.net as well because we've got some great shows on Autonomous Media as well, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I believe this week is a special week of the month because we've got the uh, the monthly show for the minute of Dr. Rock. I know uh, 
Doc puts out some fabulous shows. He's been he's been going an awful long time. He's got a good following, and uh, I, I gather one or two people are uh, missing him. So, as far as I'm aware, Doc's back to uh, this Thursday from 8 p.m. So, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Doc. Um, normally, when Doc's not around, Freeman Jack's doing his Psychonautilus show. Um, so it's, some pretty mind-blowing information in there um and then who else have we got on um, we've got tony tony hurst and mark windows do a show on sunday night and uh they've got some good i i uh, enjoyed the one they did recently about political correctness that's uh, a, a pet topic of mine it's something i hate with a passion and, yeah uh, cultural marxism yeah, well, I, you know, I think I, I'm about as politically correct as Rob Halford, and I think that just about says it for me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the, the political correctness is is it's like um, if anybody wants to criticise anything in the mainstream, they they usually um, go beyond the bounds of political correctness, just as anybody who. Uh, who might criticise Israel will go along the bounds of anti-Semitism. It, it's something that's used. It's a weapon that's used yeah, against well, free speech. For me, when I, I, I mean, I've kind of been watching this political correctness come about, and for me, as soon as I heard the phrase, and particularly when I saw what it was doing to the language, I thought. This is what George Orwell was telling us about in 1984. Except in 1984, it's called double speak. Yeah. Oh no, it's so. It's called yeah, double speak. Um, but there's they they change the meaning of words. You know, uh, war is peace and love is hate and all this and and it, it just. They make it so that the language... It's, it's a bit like the legalese, you know. The words don't mean what they're supposed to mean. Now it's like the word gay. Now that comes to mean someone with um, a preference for these uh, partners of the same sex. When I grew up, I never heard that phrase... Or never heard that word used in that context. For me, it was just jolly. You know, I used to love going to the gaiety theatre when we were Butlins on our holidays when I was a kid. But, that is uh, so gay, Andy. Yeah, Sorry, I know. But that is so gay. I'm gay as a come, mate. Me. <laughs> yeah, in the true sense of the word, rather than the uh, the exactly. hijacked sense of the word, which is which. It, it, we, we, we've had a lot of words hijacked. Um, I remember, if you, I remember back in the day when um, the uh, what was it? Um, Derek Bird, when he was shooting people, he would gone out and he shot people in in Cumbria and all this sort of thing. And this is another direct example mm. of the way that our language has been bastardised and 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 been made to to mean something else. Because they talked about one of the people who would who, who had allegedly been shot by Derek Bird, who was a rugby player, mm -hmm. and they called him a hero. Now, this guy, all he was doing, he was cutting a hedge. And, and he'd he been shot. shot by a guy that had gone past him. Mm. So, to me, uh, and they started calling him a hero. So, to me, what they're doing is that they're substituting the word victim for hero. Yeah, there was another, uh, there was a recent example of that, uh, uh, particularly struck me. And that was the uh, the, the supposed, like, uh, ram raid on Parliament when that geezer rammed his car into some railings and then charged at a load of coppers armed with MP5s with a kitchen knife or something. Um, the, the, there was a policeman who was allegedly killed there and he was hailed as a hero. Well, mm -hmm. What did he do? He got stabbed. He's a victim. He's mm. not a hero, he's a exactly. victim. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this all comes from um, when we're sending our troops to um, different places in the world you know when they, they were you get this help for heroes okay now these aren't heroes all these are is people that are being told to go into a, a, a another country and kill all the people that are there they're not heroes but the the victims 
yeah more than anything else because what they're doing is they're being duped into going into countries to fight against if somebody came into our country and said um what what would i be because i'm fighting anybody that's coming into our country mm. and, and trying to take over what would i be what what an insurgent a terrorist <laughs> what would i be you yeah. see, the, the language is, is such a huge part of this big deception. The language has been bastardized. The language has been, is, it, it, like you say, it's double speak. Up is down, down is up. Mm-hmm. Peace is war, war is peace. It, it, and it's, it, it just, it, it, it's just astounding to me the, the way that we've been, uh, we, we've uh, allowed this to happen. Because how. <coughs> It's our fault, really. <laughs> you know, these people that put these these things on us, instead of us saying that's absolutely ridiculous, w- why are we not saying that this is wrong? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was actually doing a bit of studying the other day and, and that exact issue came up. <clears throat> and it was talking about um, who we are and knowing who we are. It, it was to do with some legal stuff. And um, when it was talking about the law, it was saying, well, okay, we started out with God or a creator and they created mankind and they they were given dominion over the earth and all the things that crawl and live there. And then man created government. So Mm -hmm. the question is, how on earth can government be more powerful than man because it was created by man but in reality it there's only one way that government can be more powerful and that is that man gave away his power well it's no it's through language oh, just think were, about it they were obviously it's through language tricked into it but, but because of the way the educational system the the broadcast media the newspapers work People believe that they were going for something better than what they'd already got. They were tricked into to giving away their sovereignty, their power. And and we're also we're also tricked by language as well, because don't forget the council became the local authority. Now what does the word authority mean? Yeah, yeah. Authority. It means it's authorized to do things against you. Well, I think we had a, a very good illustration of the difference between uh, power and authority when we had Chrissy Morris on all that way back. Um, first time we had him on. Can you remember that? He no, gave... you'll have to remind me of that. Right. His illustration of the difference between power and authority was shown by a conversation he had with a Bobby. <clears throat> and the cop says, I've got the authority to do that. He says, no, you haven't. You've got the power to do it. He said, uh, well, explain the difference. He said, well, I've got the power to jump on top of your police car, drop me kecks, and do a poo on the roof of your police car. But he said, I haven't got the authority to do that. (laughs) Quite simple, really, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah, but that that's the way that language has been turned against us. Lang- language is, is the most powerful thing, and it's been turned against us. You know, ca- like I said before, councils have been turned into authorities. Since when did a servant become an authority figure? You know, exactly. It, it, a public servant, since when did they become an authority figure? A council worker was a public servant. Mm. If, you, if they're in the, author- the local authority... The, the the words in the title, mm. and and just be just simply because the words in the title, most people will accept that authority yeah. because it says the word authority. So that's the power of language, and that's the power of um, of what they're doing to our language, and and now we're acquiescing to it as well. Mm. Yeah, I saw um, a short video that Mark Salonda posted earlier today, and he, he was talking about that very thing. He said. You know, the, the council are our servants. Well, how the head, hell are they bossing us about and telling us what to do? And also, how many people do you know with servants that pay the servants more than they pay themselves? Yep. It's, it, it's all completely upside down. 
and uh, I don't know. I I do so much enjoy people getting their small victories because each one of these victories is like a crack in the dam, isn't it? There's the little Dutch boy there, and they've got their finger in the dam, and as long as we've got folks keeping putting cracks in there, they're eventually going to run out of boys and fingers to, to plug the gaps. So I say keep on going, guys, and, and keep in, keep beating the system whatever way you can. Any any victory, however small, is a victory. Yeah, that's right. And and, and while, while on our side, because we, we, we take our time to research these things and there's um, hero people out there like... I'm, I'm going to mention them. Chrissy Morris, Toby Lee, um, Paul Webster, all these people out there that are doing doing the things that they you know that they're telling people to do. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not just blatherskite. This is not just somebody who's saying things and not coming to any conclusion and making any um, you know any coherent coherent. Um, sense these are all people and i know these people have got differences between each other but these are all people that are out there that are doing good things and so um whilst ever they're out there and we're out there and th there are people that are willing to put themselves on the line and to and to try these things because don't forget everything everything that uh, that becomes law in a court that's precedent it has to be tried at first and for that to happen there has to be people out there that are willing to try to do these things and so whilst i don't care what side of the argument you're on with anybody just support all these people that are trying to trying to shed a light on uh, on, on what's really happening and, and what's going on because you know it it just seems that we we've got people walking towards um a sort of oblivion you know they just seem to be walking into oblivion the the things are getting tighter and tighter for everybody and everybody seems to be blindfoldly walking into oblivion and thinking that someone's going to come along and help them whereas it's not but there are people like like i mentioned chrissy morris toby lee um like paul webster who are doing things that are or if, if, if you just listen to them, stop and listen and not ask them to do it for you, then, you you know, you, you're going to be in a lot better position than you would have been without them. Andy. Oh, sorry. Uh, I did get an email this week off one of our listeners. I, I haven't got round to replying yet, but I will do. And he was asking me if we'd got a template layer to, to help stop the water company, I think it was, double dipping and robbing his money for the service that it's already paid for. So, uh, unfortunately, my answer would be, uh, he did explain as well that he'd be no good in court, you know, a bag of nerves and, and wouldn't function very well in court. Now, for me, a template letter is, is not a good idea in that situation. Because what you're doing there with a template letter is you're kicking the ball down the road slightly and you're going to need to deal, know how to deal with it once the council come back at you, which they invariably will. So just using a template letter is, is really just storing up trouble for yourself. Uh, if you're going to tackle it, for me, there is only one way. You need to study um, whoever's material it is that you're going to use. You need to study the source material, the legislation. You need to get your head around it. You need to understand how it works. And you need to be able to uh, to put your argument and also to defend your argument. So um, a template letter for me would be a, a really unwise move to make in that situation without you've done your homework and you're studying beforehand. So... Uh, if, if you're listening, uh, I know who you are, but I'm not going to mention you on air. I don't want to cause any embarrassment. I will uh, write to your email. I apologise. I uh, have been uh, struggling to get back to people on emails lately, but I'll try and get caught up on that in the near future. 
Uh, oh, we've got a message in here. Too many groups fighting against each other. That's absolutely scribble. Uh, sick to death of hearing about it, to be honest. And he says, Rob S. in Scotland is doing good things, but no one seems to want to back him up. Uh, that, I believe that's Robert Sproul. Um, I've seen quite a few of Robert's videos, and he, he does seem to be... Uh, taking on the system i know he he gets quite he, he used to get quite a bit of support from people's internet radio from when we were there i know he used to quite regularly come on and talk to uh pat velden scotland is free on a monday night there so i hope they're still giving him back up yeah well i'm not i'm not um i don't really know rob s at all um or so um i don't, I don't know anything about that at all no no fair so, enough. Uh, you'll, you'll have to uh, you'll have to elaborate on that a little bit more yeah I, well I, it might be an idea to try and get rob on but he, he's got a, a really broad scots accent and i'll be honest i struggle with um getting rob's drift i don't normally struggle with accents but rob's accent i do particularly so uh, we'll, we'll see what he's doing, see if he's busy, and maybe see if we can get him on sometime in the future. But uh, yeah, no. yeah. The point, the point, the scribble make about too many groups fighting against each other. I mean, did, did, uh, this is this is right. Mm. But but what you've got to do is you've got to break down that. Have a look. For anybody that's like you know not got a dog in the fight, so who's not on any particular side? You got what you've got to do is you've got to look at who's the protagonist, who's who's making this happen. Mm. Who is doing this? And and I'm not going to point fingers at anybody in any way, shape, or form. But um, if you can, if you can if you can make a, a conscious decision on who is causing it, then you know who to remove from 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 your little circle. Mm. Yeah, because it's um, do, do, do. oh wow. <laughs> I've just got a message concerning Nick, but it's not from Nick yet, so I'm hoping somebody might be able to give him a nudge. So, all right. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I know, I know um, we did that show. Well, you and Paul did that show with Chrissy and Tobe, and it, it was. With the with the intention of of trying to find some common ground and and get the two on good terms and if not working together at least not working against one another and it's it's unfortunate that that really didn't happen and and I feel quite sad about that but <clears throat> that's no way going to mean that I'm going to fall out with Chrissy or I'm going to fall out with Tobe you know I think both of them are doing. Uh, important things and uh, I, I want to encourage both of them to carry on doing what they're doing yeah and uh, <clears throat> yeah it, 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 it was a difficult thing and, and we did get a lot of criticism for um, hosting that particular um, show that extra show on s that Saturday night mm. but I, I, I really want to I would really want people to understand that what all I was trying to do is or trying to get this out into the open and to try to um, to try to get some sort of closure on it so that people could then move forward yeah. um, and I, I know we got a lot of criticism and there were a lot of people that saying that we we're just doing it for for you know to get people to listen but <laughs> You know, guys on radio stations, that's what we're here for. We want people to listen, don't we? So well, I'm yeah. not going to make any apologies for that. Yeah. You know, so, but all I was, what I was trying to do, I saw an opportunity where we could get them both on air and we could try and sort it out. And yes, it would have helped us with listeners, but also, it, you know, the intention was there to try to resolve this matter between two people that were doing great work and really we didn't want to we didn't want them to sort of break away and, and be two different factions mm. working essentially on the same thing but having some sort of dislike for each other yeah well 
Um, for anybody who thinks we did what we did for ratings, yeah, obviously we, we're doing what we're doing, so we kind of hope that people listen. But I think it's fair to say that, that you and I are both of the opinion we, we don't really take that much notice of listener stats. Uh, w- what we, we're after is um, the hope that our information is going to make things a little bit clearer to people. Uh, maybe give some people some new insight into what's going on in the world and it, if we do that to one person every time we go on air or one person every fortnight then i think um that that's we've achieved what we set out to do um as for the big numbers yeah we got bigger numbers than normal than that quite considerably so but really that didn't do us any particular favors because none of those extra listeners that turned in or a very, very, very small number will ever come back because um, they showed up for a fight and that's what they got and normally we don't have um, boxing matches on Raconteurs News so we probably won't see any of them again and it's a shame but, but you know we, we're aware of that situation so as for doing it for numbers that's really not a um, a, a valid criticism I'd say yeah, well, I mean, I got we got one or two two comments in in that vein on on my YouTube um, account when I posted that up, but um, like you say, it, the amount of people that come back, it really isn't worth it. <laughs> you know, in, in interrupting your Saturday, I mean, I spent all day on the phone. I was on the phone with Chrissy Morris. I was on the phone with uh, Toby Lee. I was, you know, it, it, it was just. I spent the entire day doing that. And then we did this show at night and mm. we got criticism for it. And all we were really trying to do is just trying to get some people that were, were you know, doing good work back on an even keel. But and it didn't work out, but I don't think we should be criticised for that. Well, for me, if I saw that you and Aid had had a big fallout about something, I'd try and get me sent over there and say, come on, Let's let's sit, have a meeting together, just sit down and talk. And uh, I'd hope that that we're all uh, good enough mates that that no matter what we fell out, we could bury the hatchet about. And uh, I'm I'm pretty damn sure we could, you know. Yeah, yeah. I suppose again, it's like it's like all the things that happen. The, the, the internet seems to put a magnification on. Um, very, very, very minor uh, fallouts, uh, discussions, disagreements, that sort of thing. The mm. internet puts a puts a, puts a magnification on it, and it, and the more people that are involved, the more people that are following the people that are having the falling out, then the more the magnification is. And so, uh, yeah, again, I think we probably it's like the, with the UFO thing, with the Larry Warren stuff. You, you really need to move away from it and, and and move towards something that's going to be a little bit more, you know, a, a, a centrifile. If 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 you really want to put it into a, a into a common purpose phrase, mm. um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think I think we should move on from that and and perhaps talk about what what do you think about the. Um, DUP Tory alliance that's just really happened <coughs> well um, I'm just wondering if George Carlin actually wrote the script for that one because it, it sounds like one straight out of one of his comedy routines doesn't it you know mm-hmm. we, we haven't got money for the NHS we're going to have to sell that to all our, our rich chums and make them even richer there's no money to um to spend on schools we can't give school children a free meal we can't provide free nursery education but that's 14 pence a day by the way to give kids a school meal 14 pence a day jeez yeah i know i know the the economies of scale you can get in catering a huge um once you start making really big amounts of food it gets really really cheap i know that from being in the catering business myself in a small way um but yeah i mean 
And then you look at the the uh, Grenfell Tower. What was it that saved? 50 grand by cladding it in fireproof materials. Five grand. Five grand. Five I mean, that's grand. even worse. I mean, that is... Well, I mean, uh, I saw some interesting stuff in the chat room whilst um, Aid was on air last night, and uh, one of the guys who posted in there was saying he'd contacted the company who makes the cladding and asked them, uh, being as it says on their website, that their main or main part of their business is, is providing this service to schools and hospitals, how many schools and hospitals are being clad in this material? And they, uh, as you might expect, they ignored him. So he emailed the Prime Monster, Theresa May or may not, and waiting for a reply. But uh, I can't see him getting one, can you? No, not really. No. But, you know, they, here we are. We're, we're told this is austerity. Um, and, and Mark... Salon did a pretty good rant on it today. He's saying the Queen's got 80 million quid a year pay rise, which I'd actually missed that because I I'd, I'd tend to stay away from news websites because there's just so much rubbish on there. And uh, the, the government's getting pay rise. Yet they can't form a government. So what do they do? They get a known terrorist organisation and they give them... A huge wedge of money that was covered all those issues that we're just talking about. And suddenly, Theresa May finds Jeremy Corbyn's magic money tree. Wonder where she had that stuffed. Hmm. And also, what you've got to remember is, just before the election, Jeremy Corbyn was um, was vilified for uh, f- something from years ago where he had perhaps been in, you know, in, in negotiations with Sinn Féin and the IRA, and yet now we've got a Tory government that is in bed with a terrorist, it, which is a terrorist organisation, yeah. you know. And and, and the DUP, <laughs> the, uh, the Democratic Unionists, were... We're a terrorist organisation, and yet before the election, because Jeremy Corbyn was advocating talks with the IRA and Sinn Féin, and he was called a terrorist sympathiser, but it's not happening with uh, Theresa May. It's it's really weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've just got a message now. Uh, our mutual friend has phoned Nick at his home phone number, and there's no answer, and they can't leave a message, so... Uh, we're just hoping that everything's okay with Nick and uh, we'll do our best to get him back on. After all, we don't always read books to do shows, so we've both read the book. We might as well make the most of it, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we certainly are, yes. Yeah, we'll, we, yeah, we'll get him on at a future date. Uh, obviously, there's something's come up with Nick, and so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to get him on at a future date. Yeah, these things happen all the time. It's unfortunate, but um, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I mean, I, I saw... I, I did actually, um, while we were waiting to come on air and hoping and hoping that Nick might turn up, I thought, I'll, I'll just have a flick on a news website. And my kind of go-to one is RT. And I li- clicked on the UK and there's load of the usual waffle but you were talking about the armed forces earlier and the heroes well they ain't been treated like heroes by the uh, the people who uh, provide them with their equipment and particularly with their uh, medical help because it appears that um, have you come across that uh, anti-malarial drug larium no, no, oh, no. Right. Well, there's uh, a lot of reports that it's causing serious um, mental health issues. It's been nicknamed the zombie drug. Turns soldiers into zombies, apparently. Um, it can cause depression and hallucinations. So, yeah, that's really good if you're out there in the field with a machine gun, isn't it? But apparently it's banned uh, in an awful lot of countries in the world, but our armed forces are still giving it to our guys for malaria, so good on them. Shows you really appreciate it, guys. 
Yeah. Heroes. Heroes given drugs that are going to cause them problems and going to kill them and whatever. Mm. Yeah. It just shows it just shows the contempt that that the the ruling class, the 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 people that send these people to war. It just shows the absolute contempt they've got for these for these young let's face it they are young lads aren't they yeah yeah they're, they're, they're young men in the prime of life you know they're sent away to other people's countries to kill their children hmm yeah is that the best use of your offspring your progeny I would have thought maybe not I thought they could do more useful things at home here but then again, some people believe that if we don't go and bomb the crap out of Syria, then they're going to bomb the crap out... Oh, no, that never happened, did it? No. Hmm. And it never will as well, either. We know that, don't we? No, of course, yeah. It's, it's shameful, really. It, 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 to be fair, I, I do feel ashamed to be British a lot of the time. Because, I mean, what what we do in the name of... Got being British. <laughs> yeah, I mean, w- one of the things that um, I mean, uh, Aid and uh, Rob were talking about was Rob mentioned the British history of colonialism in passing, and Aid says, "Well, I tell you now, I'm not proud to be British, not by a long chalk." And uh, most people are aware of the past of this country are certainly not proud of it. And and to be fair, it's not the dim and distant past; it's still bloody going on. And, you know, I hear it from so many people. Oh, but we're just a puppet of the United States. You know, we're just the the tail that's the the US is the dog and we just wag whenever that. But when you start to look into it, really, the United States is just another colony still. It's just another proxy. Um, I know a lot of people will argue against that, but I firmly believe the crown has a a massive control and interest still in, in the USA. Um, I don't know if you've looked into that at all. But you were telling me earlier that, um, that, that hasn't the, the monarchy just had a £6 million pay increase? Well, I, I, I haven't seen the exact figures, but I'm sure Mark Salon went it was £80 million quid a year increase, which sounds absolutely astonishing. Quid. I mean, I remember hearing about getting a five million a year raise a couple of years ago, but eighty million quid a year is—I mean—and that's the blood, blood, sweat, and tears of you folks. <laughs> Please yeah. do, don't don't think it's not. It is. It's your money. It's your money. And 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 eighty eight. If that if Mark Salon, what Mark Salon is saying is right, that's eighty million quid. Your that that's more than you'll ever. Go blimey! That's more than you'll ever, ever even see in a, in in a lifetime. Mm. So, you know, wh- why do we allow this? Why do we why do we allow this for for somebody that's clearly not got the best interest of the people at heart? Because this is happening while austerity is going on. Austerity is still happening in this country. People are people right at the very bottom are getting. Are getting screwed over, are getting taken in for assessments and told like somebody once said it close to me um, when they were told that somebody was going in for an assessment for a PIP or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, somebody once said to me, "I hope they're wearing a coffin when they go in." Because if you're not wearing a coffin, you're not getting it. You're not getting anything. No. And that's the way that it is. It's turned. That's the way it's turned out. Yeah, it it's absolutely bloody describe. Ah, Mahatma, he's just uh, just filled in the blanks for me there. He says the U.S. is still under the crown via the Virginia Company. That was yeah, that was the link that I was trying to think of. And he said, I have yet to meet someone fluent in British. Well, yeah, but. Uh, going back to Rob again he made a fabulous point last night is uh, English really an actual language because it's just a bastardisation of several other languages isn't it 
um, you know, when when the English language started to take shape, it was around the time that William the Bastard came over, and it was kind of a melding together of the the French, which was spoken by the aristocracy, uh, Latin spoken by the priesthood, particularly the the Roman priesthood, and the uh, Anglo-Saxon spoken by the peasants, and you, you kind of put that all in a pot put a fire under it, give it a bit of a stir, and we've come out with this thing called English, which, you know, it, it, it's full of all kinds of weird anomalies, you know, and it, some strange anomalies in English that you don't get in other languages. There's something very odd about that language. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that is almost... It, if English was you, was invented as a particular tool to, to get us channeled down a certain path, thinking in a certain way, and to, to bring us to the point we're at now, where we all believe that, you know, we've got to do... Well, sorry. Where the masses believe that they've got to do as they're told by the government. They're servants. Mm, yeah. I, I know that... The, the, but I've been studying language... Throughout Europe, there's large bastardizations of every every single language. Yeah, yeah. Um, depending on on the period of time, who was in charge, who was doing, you know, who was doing the bidding, who was doing. So, I, I think probably English is um, an Anglo-Saxon, an Anglo-Saxon. I know it's Germanic, but it's also Anglo-Saxon in origin. And I think that, that, that there's nothing that you could say about English that you couldn't say about any other language. You know, hmm. I think it's probably been the same in every single culture, in every language that's been going on for for thousands and thousands of years within Europe. Yeah. 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 I suppose. Yeah, I suppose if you if you looked at all of the languages, you would be able to eventually find that that they've all got those same sorts of anomalies. Maybe it's just me being overly suspicious. I don't know. Yeah, well, we can't blame you for that because you are English, so you must be paranoid, and you smoke weed as well, which we also know. Yeah, that don't make me paranoid, Dan. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but people will try and tell you that, won't they? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been with a lot of people who get paranoid when they're smoking it, and it—it's not a pleasant experience for me because I don't get that. So it's really difficult for me to relate to, and I, I just say, "No, you'll be all right. Don't worry about it." But. I've learnt one or two tricks now that that can help people with that, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a strange situation. I mean, something that's occurred to me as well. We've been covering false flags now. What the last three shows that we've done? Yep. And tonight was supposed to be another false flag show, but for one reason or another, we haven't been able to uh, put that show out. And uh, it, it just seems curious that we start covering it and then all of a sudden there's a bit of a lull. Or do you think that's just because we've got the selection out of the way, things are all in total chaos, there's no need for it at the minute? Mm. Um, uh, do you know? I don't know. What, what's your thoughts? I don't know. It's it, it does seem curious. It seems to be a bit of a lull, but I'm I'm not expecting the lull to go on that long because, as you say, we've got the anniversary of September 11th coming up, which they usually ramp things up for. So. Yeah, it's probably just a just one of those temporary lulls that you pointed out to us happen so often in this this artificial script that we're living in. This this Shakespearean drama. Mm. 
yeah, well, well, what's what's happening is there's probably going to be another couple of terrorist attacks, but we're in summertime now, so it's not going to happen for a while. And this is one of the one of the things I wanted to bring up with um, uh, Nick Collistrom was the um, which I, I noticed was omitted from his book um, was the Tunisia attack. Mm-hmm. Um, now it, we know that that these things. We got all these attacks leading up to the election, and then they've gone. They've suddenly disappeared, yeah. right? But they needed something else that wasn't so obvious. So then we get the Grenfell Tower uh, situation, which is a, I, th- I think, could be the turning point. I think it could be the turning point because look at look at look at it for a first start. Um, in uh, now, I know Doctor. Uh, sorry, Nick Collistrom's not here tonight. But reading from his book earlier on, he said that um, he was talking about the Lee. Rig- there was a chapter on the Lee, Rip- Lee Rigby um, episode, mm-hmm. and he said there were key. Um, points in that. Now, Lee Rigby was suppo- was a British soldier. He was supposed to be coming from the Tower of London, another British iconic building, mm-hmm. and going back to the barracks. Uh, uh, Woolwich Barracks, wasn't it? At Woolwich, yeah, mm-hmm. which is another key iconic... That area is iconic um, barracks area. So all these things, all these elements were were involved, mm. and so what I think what I think has happened is we've had these iconic places again. Westminster, we have Westminster attack, mm-hmm. Manchester attack, um, a, a music attack in Manchester, which let's face it was. Yeah. In the nineties, it was a, a, a the music centre of the world. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think the these things are psychologically charged to make people think that there's an attack on British culture. Mm. Whereas these attacks aren't really happening at all. We know, like. Uh, Paul Sturms just put Lee Rigby equals fiction into yeah. the uh, into the chat box. I saw that. Yeah, we we know that. Mm. We we know that that were fiction, yeah. absolute fiction. And if it wasn't fiction, then there are easy ways for the authorities, and I know why I'm calling them the authorities, but that's what they call themselves. Yeah. So I'm not saying they're authoritarian over me, but that is something that they could s- straight away put to bed you know and and show that show the pictures show the real situation that happened on that day but they're not going to now what we've got to do is we've got to try and decipher between what is real and what is not real yeah. at, at I... the moment Sorry, I've just been I've just been reading the chat room and uh, a non seven four nine five has just creased me up. I think that might be Patrick. <laughs> he just said, well, whilst in the USA, a stupid yank asked my wife if she'd ever been bedridden. The answer was, no, but I've been table ended on many occasions. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, um, yeah, and also goes on to say that I think the, t- the it is the right time as people are more relaxed during the warm weather. I mean, I I was seriously expecting some huge riots to kick off over this Grenfell Towers business. I see that there has been some disturbances, but not quite as big as I expected. Uh, did you expect to see more, Jason? Well, I, d- I don't know. I, d- I, I don't know because what all I'm seeing is on social media. So um, what what whatever social media allows me to see, I'll see. So I don't I don't I actually don't know what is going on down there, and you can't really know what's going on until you're down there, can you? 
No, no. Um, we, I think it was Saturday night this week. Um, we've been uh, spending a bit of time in front of the uh, idiot screen, but not not with it connected to the wall. We've just been watching a few movies and stuff like that. And uh, Saturday night, we decided to watch V for Vendetta. I've never actually seen that movie all the way through. I've seen no end of clips from it. And, yeah, I thought it was a pretty good movie. But uh, just watching it now, it, it kind of it does build your sense of expectation that, that, that something's got to bloody well happen soon. Something's got to give. How much of this shit are people going to put up with before they eventually say, enough of this and no more? Well, I've heard quotes from people saying London's about to pop. Mm. And and this uh, Glenfell Tower business is, I think, is 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 the catalyst that's going to make it pop. Um, I think it was like uh, the Mark Duggan situation when um, when the riots first happened in 2011. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about those riots from one person being killed imagine the riots from 500 people being killed because we know these people are being we, we know there's at least five six hundred people in that building yeah. dead from that we know that yeah. there's there's no you know people are going around saying i can't find anybody in hospitals that is injured from that from that building nobody i no. can't find my friends i can't there are people from there that are gone they are just gone. And some of these people will be um, illegal immigrants, people who are sealing, seeking asylum from other places. And it's so easy for them to be kept out of the official response, you know, the official figures that it's a crime. It's an actual crime. The, 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 the government have put a D notice in place, which I've seen enough evidence to say that there's a D notice in place. I know, I know where a D notice is in place mm -hmm. to say that they can't report on the actual proper figures. Uh, but they all comply. This is what I don't understand. It, well, I do understand it because they're all paid off and they don't want to lose their, you know, half a million pound a year jobs uh, you know being a Sky News presenter simply because they're going to tell the truth mm. but how can these people do this? This is what I can't understand. How can people do this? I've given up I've given up jobs because I didn't agree with you know the way that things were being run or what we were supposed to tell people or I've given up jobs yeah. that have paid me Tons of money. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, but I, yet there are people that will that that will just comply with this myth simply because it serves their own purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been in the same position. I, I, I've lost count of the number of jobs I've walked out on because uh, I've been asked to do something I consider is unethical or dangerous or what. I mean, danger. Ooh. Um, being asked to cut corners on safety, perhaps that sort of thing. Um, I've walked out of those jobs without a regret. Admittedly, it's getting more and more difficult to walk out of a job because the the kind of support network is is being removed. Really, isn't it? The 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 um, benefit system is is kind of being dismantled in front of our eyes. But that's been going on for years. Oh it's been yeah, going yeah. on for years. Yeah. Absolutely, years. And if people can't make a, you know, got to make contingency contingency plans, I know there are people that can't can't make contingency plans. No. Because, you know, they physically cannot do it. But there has to be a, there has to be some point where the people, and I'm not talking about it, it. I'm not talking about people where it's affecting, but I'm actually talking about the people that can see that it's affecting other people, but they're not quite at the point where it's affecting them at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they need to stand up and say, look, whatever you're doing to the people that are below me, you're going to be doing to me eventually. So I'm not going to stand for it. But 
but people are in such a situation where they've got their own they've got their own problems they've got their own um lives and, and mortgages and things to to fulfill but at some point it's got to get to a point where we're thinking listen if i don't stand up for the people below me or the people that you know earn less than me or the people that um, are, are perceived to be less than me if i don't stand up for them there's going to be nobody left to stand up for me yeah exactly when 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 it does hit the fan which it, it, it inevitably will do it's going to it's going to go it's yeah. going to go at some point oh yeah yeah do 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 yeah it's absolutely he's got he's got to kick off at some point um i i'm just hoping that um that when people do you know lose it and start becoming active that violence is not the first thing on their mind because uh, if it becomes violent, then it's going to get really messy and there's going to be massive death toll. Don't you I, don't think, I don't think there's any other way. I really no. don't. I don't. I don't think there's any other way. I don't, I don't condone violence in any way, shape or form, but I just don't think that anything has ever been resolved peacefully. Never has mm -hmm. done. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of see where you're coming from. I did see uh, something online that there was some kind of um, demonstration after the uh, Grenfell Towers incident, and there was a large group of people assembled, and they were just totally silent. Now, I think... That does a lot more than shouting, yeah, pedos, yeah, criminals. Silence. I think silence is a lot more intimidating than shouting. Really? Well, I don't know about you, but uh, when I was a kid, uh, my dad could shout and he could get quite irate and I might get a smack across the arse if I was misbehaving. But if you went quiet... I knew to keep out the way. Yeah, yeah. I suppose there's an argument for that. It, I, look, I, all I'm saying is that I just, I, I'm not, I'm not advocating it. I just don't see how there's any other way that it's going to be resolved. Yeah, I, I guess I can see where you're coming from. Oh, there you go. Mahatma's just posted as a contingency plan for when people get fed up. Ah, the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm sure that'll make uh, heartwarming bedtime reading for us all. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just don't, I just don't think it, I, look, I'd, I'd love for it to be ended peacefully but i just don't think that there's there's a way that it can be i think people need to stand up and i think there are people standing up as well yeah um i i just don't know if they're the right people to be standing up yeah yeah that's fair comment mate i think um probably the most appropriate thing to do now would be uh have a little bit of a, a Heath interlude so we'll play a couple of tracks from Heath and then we'll be back for the second hour what do you reckon yeah good idea okay mate right we'll start with Boat on the River and then we'll follow that with Boy from Sheffield and we'll be back in just under six minutes <laughs>
touches my life like the waves on the sand And all roads will lead to tranquility base Where the frown on my face disappears And then home I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just Oh, no, 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 no,
this is Guy Taylor, and you're listening to Autonomous Media. Good evening. Welcome back to Raconteurs News. It's Tuesday night, and uh, Jason and I were expecting Dr. Nick Collistrum to be talking about his new book and discussing false flags in general tonight, but uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to hook up with Nick. We haven't found out as what's wrong with him yet, uh, what's why he hasn't been able to attend. So we'll we'll just do our best to get Nick back and get him on as, as near as possible in the future. Been as we've done our own work and read the book ready, but uh, hey, welcome back, Jason. Yep, free book, man. Can't well, fault yeah. That. Yeah, you was always saying, oh, you, I never get any freebies. What's up? So you've got one now. <laughs> yeah, first freebie ever. Yeah, I've been on a year and a half. Oh well. So any any freebies anybody's got to send us, make sure you send them to Jason, please. <laughs> yeah, you you just uh, came up with a story that's bypassed me while we're in the break there, Jace. Can you uh, give us a few details on that one? Yeah, I would just. Um, it was just about this. Uh, I'll give you the headline from Sky News: Terminally ill, terminally ill baby Charlie guards parents upset by European court decision. Now this has been going on for quite a while, mm. um, and there's a baby who's got a, a, a severe, uh, what they call irreversible brain condition, right. uh, whatever that means, because we know that you know they're talking out their asses. Mm-hmm. Um, but his parents have been. What his parents have been doing is trying to um, get him to America to um, have some what they call could be life changing, life saving um, treatment. Mm-hmm. But yet he's been battled by the courts in the United Kingdom. And uh, the European Court of Human Rights has just rejected a plea from his parents. Uh, I'll just read this bit. Mm -hmm. The European Court of Human Rights has rejected a plea from the parents of terminally ill British baby to intervene in the case. Charlie Gard has a severe uh, mitochondrial condition and in January suffered what Dr. described as irreversible brain damage. Specialists at Great Ormond Street Hospital think the 10-month-old has no chance of survival and want to end his life support treatment. But his parents, Chris Gard and Connie Yates from Bedfont, West London, wanted to undergo therapy in the, uh, a, a thera- therapeutic trial in the US. Now, this is, this is a really, really, really sad case. This is hmm. a baby who... He's only 10 months old, has got a condition, and we are now in a world where um, instead of keeping him alive at all costs and, you know, where there's life, there's hope, we're we're now getting courts to make decisions on the life and death of of babies. Mm. You know, it it just seems to me to be... um, Well, it's really upsetting, really. I mean, it's just... it's. To, what gives them the right to decide whether a child lives or dies? If there's the technology there to keep the child alive, then surely that's what should happen at all costs. Um, well, I'd, I'd put a proviso on that. Um, I'm, I'd say the, the parents must be the major decision makers on whether that child is kept alive, whether the medical fraternity think there's any hope of him making a recovery or if he's just going to be a complete vegetable in his life. Because for me, at the end of the day, those parents brought that child into this world. They're responsible for his upbringing. And what the hell's it got to do with anybody else? You know, it, it, the technology is available there to keep that child alive. If they want him kept alive, then it, it should be so. Um, but as for the courts intervening and saying, "Oh no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna," basically, what they're gonna do? Starve him to death, or stop giving him water and food? You know, Liverpool Care Pathway—it's barbaric. You know, I, I talked to a nurse who I know very well. I know she's a very caring person. About a year ago, and I said to her, "I said, 
Liverpool Care Pathway. And she, oh, yes, but it's helping people on their way when there's no hope. And I said, yeah, but helping people on the way might be giving them a little bit more of, of what's taking the pain away to, to speed the end. But withdrawing food and water, that's, that's, no, that's, that's torturing people to death, surely, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. Hmm. If the, if there's the technology there to keep somebody alive, it does. It shouldn't really matter how long they keep them alive. And and and, and again, people will point to the cost of it, but the cost. It, it, we're talking about a baby, yeah. you know, ten month old baby. Yeah. And it, it shouldn't matter what it costs. We should we should do what we can to keep where, where there's life, there's hope, and and perhaps there, there won't be any hope and. Perhaps the the baby will die, but you know we should give them, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, the the, the greatest, the best chance that they can, and the best chance is not by turning off all the life support. Simply on, on what a court says, a court that is it's a sterile thing, isn't it? It's a mm. it's a it's a room. It's a it's sterile. It's some people deciding over way, whether a baby should live or die, uh, yeah. and I just don't agree with it. And I think it's, um, I think it's absolutely outrageous. And let's face it: from what we've seen of the operations and the machinations of the court system, we know without question it's documented fact. It is a corporation. It's there to make a bloody profit. Now, how can profit come into that decision? It. But it must do. That, that, yeah, that, of course that, it does. They exist for that reason. To me, any profit-making body has no right for any sort of say in that matter. You know, the, the, there's there's a lot of people who would say, well, the, the, you know, the court's doing the right thing, but without all the information in front of you, you, you can't possibly say that. And, and without knowing that, that what the the long term prognosis is for this child i i understand there there are conditions that that it's it's almost impossible to 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 recover from but i i have i've so well but since, to, but to take away that child's life support yeah on the basis that it's going to cost too much mm. you, you know it is it's like in this country what we've got is we've got this two-tier system whereas it's not it costs too much to keep somebody alive but it doesn't cost too much to kill people no you know when we're doing raids on syria or we're doing raids on iraq or we're doing raids on afghanistan and we're throwing bombs down at five hundred thousand pounds a piece and and perhaps it's 30, 40 bombs. So what's that, 20 million quid? 20 million quid mm. on killing people, yet we're, what we're doing is we're going to court to try to, um, to, to to exonerate ourselves from spending a million quid on trying to save one child. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, well, that that is the unfortunate state of affairs with the... Um, the way the NHS has 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 been pushed. I mean, I I remember when I first took me back when I was nineteen years old. I I was treated extremely well, but I just happened to be in the Isle of Man. When I got back to the UK, which is not a tax haven, maybe the city of London is, but the UK is not. The healthcare was absolutely abysmal compared to the Isle of Man. And the the fractured vertebrae that I've been diagnosed with, they were disregarded. And I was told that I was malingering for 28 and a half years. And then eventually we get round to having an MRI scan. And the specialist that reads the MRI scan said to me, and I quote... Oh my God, I've never seen spasm like that. How do you cope? To which I replied, Well, can you tell me what the other option is, please? 
because you ain't got one. But no, it all it is about is is just the NHS has been run down. It's not doing its job properly. It, it's it's not about looking after people. It's it's about figures and and budgets and you know the people, the nurses and and a lot of the doctors. They're really caring people, but, but, it, but what you what you could remember is is that it would have cost probably about five years worth of what it would have cost to keep this kid alive for five years, mm. right? They've, they've wasted that money on trying to kill him. Yeah, yeah, because going you to know, the European and, court won't be cheap, will it? Well, of course it won't. Of course it won't. And you can and that, guarantee and how they'll long have the... would have that could have kept that kid alive. Yeah. And, yeah. and at some point, and if that, and, and even if you're just pandering to the parents, mm. I don't even see what the problem is with that. You're pandering to the parents who are, are just clinging to anything just to just to just just you know so that the kid's still alive. I, I just don't get it. Yet we'll spend ten times as much on trying to kill the kid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, they, they, I've heard said about hope. You know, it, some people call it hopium. You know, it can be a dangerous and addictive drug. But if you take away someone's hope, <laughs> to me, that's a far more dangerous thing than than perhaps giving them a little of hope where they might not already have some. Mm. Well, what do you think about these cyber attacks that have been happening on um, on? The British Parliament that have been going on this last couple of weeks. Uh, I think oh, Vlad must have been busy because it's bound to be him, isn't it? It won't be anybody else, or, is, or will it be ISIS? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's probably going to be v Vlad the Impaler. Yeah, I mean, cyber attacks. Yeah, what are they cyber attacking now? Uh, have they deleted all the records of? Uh, Kensington Chelsea Council because that would seem a good target from yep. no I mean the, these cyber we had the cyber attacks leading up to the election and it was making a big big fuss about this but then when we find out there's been election fraud all the way through the last two elections what happened oh yeah nothing nothing, nothing. not a sausage same as in the United Snakes as Rob likes to call it, and I think he's bang on there. There's election fraud in the last, I don't know how many elections, and what gets done about it? Nothing. They call it voter fraud because then it minimises the problem. It's not voter fraud, it's election fraud. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that for me, those, those parents have got the absolute right to say what happens to their child and anyone who tries to take that away just pure evil for me or to quote another one of our previous guests Rick Simpson murdering freaks yeah it just seems strange doesn't it that, um, that, that parliament were attacked recently yeah. a cyber attack again it's something that's that can't be proved it, it, but this is this is this is what uh serves their purpose because they can say they were a cyber attack we don't know do we what, no. are we privy to computers at parliament no of course we're we not. bollocks nobody is so they can say what they want they can say oh, oh we were a cyber attack with with this we with that and then it keeps perpetuating that victim myth we were talking about before yeah um a couple of shows ago uh, victim industrial complex so there were a cyber attack in parliament that makes that makes them a victim again and it, it just it, it just seems like it well it just seems nuts to me it just see it, the whole thing seems nuts i mean the the whole election seem to be nuts Mm -hmm. I see we've got a comment from uh, hmm. I'll just let check I read this right yeah ist off in the chat room thanks for that <laughs> they put donations for this child will not be government money uh, 
Donations for this child not. Government money will be used unsuccessfully. Give it a go and fuck them in power. If it was their grandchild, it would be different. Yeah, exactly. Mm, of course it would. They won't be in an NHS hospital for a fucking start. Well, all you've got to go back is, is one chief exec and look at Cameron. Cameron had a disabled child. For yeah. which he, he, as a multi-millionaire, if not billionaire, claimed every single penny he could and got it. And of course he did. Unfortunately, that child died. And what did he do? Did he, um, did he come out in sympathy with all the other parents of disabled children in the country? No. He tried to get their benefits taken away from them. He tried to he stop other parents with children in the same condition as him getting that help who actually bloody need it they're not billionaires mm. yeah that's true he's uh he's a piece of shit <laughs> well he is isn't he yeah you haven't bumped into him again have you no no just the once <laughs> Just the once, yeah, yeah. But he, again, he's 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 part of it. He he claimed everything that he was entitled to, and he probably claimed more than people, most people claim, because he he would have known he would have had 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 advisors that telling him what he's entitled to, mm -hmm. and he didn't need it. That's the thing; he didn't need it. No. No, he, but, he yeah. It would have got more than most people that do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the, the infuriating part about it. But, um, oh, I've just come across a story. Ooh, it appears we've got asylum seekers from the US on the move. Have you seen that, Jase? No, what's that? Yeah, I've just found an article here. US asylum seekers fleeing from Trump to Canada stuck in legal limbo. Well, all I can say is uh, I've got one or two good friends in Canada and I'm pretty sure they'll be pleased about the um, the mad yanks not getting over the border. <laughs> <laughs> I know whenever I talk to Ricky Dwyer, he says uh, about his uh, insane southern neighbours. So, yeah. Yeah, he'll be quite pleased they're not letting them across the border. <laughs> yeah, it's getting stupid, isn't it? It's, the world's just turning upside down isn't it into like this like this weird thing yeah it's like it's just totally weird it's just you know if if, if, if attack has become defence hmm oh I see somebody's brought up the pig which was inevitable whenever you mentioned Cameron funny enough uh, I think it was last night I I did actually watch the first rewatch the first episode of Black Mirror by Charlie Brooker and if there is a person on this planet who hasn't seen it please 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 find it and watch it it is absolutely excellent um and I'd love to sit and have a pint with Charlie Brooker and find out or see if I could find out what he knows and where he gets to know what he knows because he knows more. <laughs> he's like, he, he swore blind that he didn't have any information to, uh, to suggest that, you know, he was along the right lines there. But I, it, it was just too close to the truth that came out a while after that for, it, for him not to be prompted in some way, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Sounds interesting. I and think, then... Yeah. And then I watched the second one. And the second one was about some technology where you got a little implant behind your ear. And what it allowed you to do with a small remote control was to look on some, like, look like contact lenses. Or you could project it onto the screen when you were at home and rewind your memories. Now, I know a lot of people... <clears throat> they were technology junkies, and you offered them something like that. They would rip your arm out of the socket. No question. They wouldn't ask any questions about it. They'd just want it. Now, what what it did, um, it, it, it basically, the, there was this guy who was a lawyer, and 
it looked like his job was kind of hanging in the balance and then he he went home from this meeting went to meet his wife a bit of a house party and his his wife was kind of being a mm, perhaps slightly over affectionate for a, a long lost boyfriend and of course he kept rewinding and playing and rewinding and playing i mean firstly the the guy was living in by what most people's standards the the, the his life situation his house his home his his kind of bank balance was a dream for most people unless you're a multimillionaire you you'd want what he had yet he spent okay. most of his life sucking on a bottle of whiskey and rewinding to see what his wife had been up to i mean he wasn't even living his bloody fantastic life he was li reliving what he'd already done and to me that what was a perfect illustration of one small aspect of this kind of uh, mind computer interface that that's been pushed upon us that can destroy a people's life that was just one tiny part there must be so many other parts of it that could cause you real grief but until you you're in possession and using that technology you, you kind of don't work out what they are and I, I just thought, yeah, I, I know so many people. <laughs> They'd be jumping to get that. And they're always rowing as it is before they've even got it. So God knows what. They're killing each other <laughs> within a week of getting it, I'm sure. But, yeah, mm. you say, oh, yeah, you, you won't have to remember things. You'll be able to rewind and remember. Yeah, no, thanks. I like forgetting things sometimes. Awesome, brother. So, what do we got else from the chat room? Oh, yeah. Theresa May or May not. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about this one? This, this is a great story. I love this. Mm -hmm. a, a bloke who, who uh, called his convenience store. Um, I think it, it must be Indian. He called it Singsbury's. <laughs> Yeah. Right, but Sainsbury's threatened to sue him, so he called it Morrisings <laughs> instead. <laughs> the, these are the sort of stories we should be focusing on. These are the good stories. Was his name Sing by any chance? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, Gel Sing Nagra. Oh, that, yeah, smart guy. Obviously, I like his style. Yeah. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, yeah. Do, I, I remember a guy um, years ago that got s sued because he called his he, he he opened up like a pound shop type thing called Sparks and Mensa. <laughs> oh, there's been some good ones over the years, aren't they? <laughs> what was that one we saw in them? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we saw we we saw one called Sainsbury's. Berries. Oh B right. W -E B E double -R, R Y. Ah, you see, if you if somebody had just been a bit sharper there, they could have called it sans berries, you know, like as in the French, as in we don't have any. It's like so <laughs> if it had been a shoe shop, yeah, sorry, we don't have berries, mate. Well, it's just a sign saying what we do. <laughs> but yeah, that what do they call that? Passing off, isn't it? Where you, I don't you, know what they call it. Yeah, where you make you have a trade name or a trademark that is sufficiently similar to another well-known one that they might think that that their customers might think that the, the the little kebab shop round the corner called Jim McDonald's is actually the Golden Arches bullshit. Yeah, I think you should be every man for themselves anyway, don't you? As, as, what you mean as far as trademarks and all that go? Well, yeah, of course it should be. Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose it, it's kind of. It's like somebody's not going to. Nobody is going. Nobody is going to 
uh, <laughs> it's going to it's going to mistake Morrison's for Morris Sings <laughs> in Gateshead. Oh uh, right, yeah. You know what I mean? Nobody, nobody is are they? I mean, it should be every month. You know when these, when these con- you called Sinsbury's. I mean, it, it, it's not going to cause any. It's not going to cause Sainsbury's any loss, is it? No. Nobody, nobody's going to go there instead of. You know, it's just like. Oh, well, just no, weird. I suppose he might get one or two numb nuts complaining because he won't take the next card or something like that. <laughs> And we, to, today has been fifty years of cash points as well. What what have you been? What has what your cash point stories been? Fifty years cash points. Yeah. Oh yes, I I know who the first man to use a cash point was. Go on. It's just come to me, Red Giovanni, the bloke who played what was it? Stan on on the buses. Yeah, he's there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I don't think I've any particularly uh, mad stories about cash points. I've, I've but seen... what do you think about cash? Because cashless society, because they were today on um, BBC Breakfast, I was watching and there was this bloke who got um, he got a cafe in London, he said. Yeah. And it was <laughs> one of the first ones that were going cashless. Mm. Yeah, well, as a friend of ours, he'd been over to uh, Sweden not long back and he was saying that he had that problem there. He said they're, they're going for cashless um, in a big way. He said he, he just went in a cafe and wanted a coffee for a wife and a beer for him and tried to give him cash and they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't do that, <laughs> which he thought was really strange. Well, it is really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, but I'm also... Offered, I'm with... giving you the value of what you're, what, you know... I'm giving it you in notes, like I have done traditionally for fucking years. Yeah. And so we're, you're not taking it. So what's the replacement going to be? This contactless phones where somebody behind you in the queue can rob you if they know how to do it? Or is it going to be the the implanted or tattooed chip? Because either way, they're both, I would say... If they're more secure than cash, it's only marginally so. But by using those methods, you also bring out new problems and new problems with security of of whatever balance you've got in that account. Because if it's a microchip or a tattoo uh, and that's your money, then people aren't going to be mugging you for your wallet, are they? They're going to be wanting that piece of flesh that contains your microchip or your tattoo. Mm. So you're going to see a, a different turn in the mugging industry. But like when we used to have um, CIA rip, rios, report um, on, yeah, there was it, there was also always a good argument against a cashless society because, as we know which I think is uh, people that, that uh, listening to this and people that know that what, what we're talking about know that um, this is mostly fueled by narcotics, which is, which requires cash. Mm. Oh yeah. It, yeah. The, the world runs on God, doesn't it? Gold, oil and drugs. And if you remove cash, then it, it's not going to be so easy for the governments to, to launder the money from their illegal activities. Interesting comment there from Mithrin in the in the chat room. He said his uncle was both a bus driver and a spitting image of Reg Varney. Oh, I, I'm s- sorry, mate. I don't believe, but I don't buy that. I think your uncle really was Reg Varney. He just kept it quiet from you. <laughs> And he had a bus. Mm. Maybe he wasn't even a bus driver. Maybe he just had a bus and liked buses. Well, it could have been. I don't think I like where we're going here. No. But, you know. 
No, we'll, we'll, we'll stay away from buses then, shall we? Yeah. No, I mean, we, we, yeah, but the, the cashless society, I mean, yeah, your tattoos and your, your implants, they're going to be targets for muggers, aren't they? So I, I'll be brutally honest, if I was going to be mugged, I'd rather I'd be mugged for my wallet than I would for a tattoo that was implanted in my neck or my hand or my arse or a tattoo. But it, it, it's obvious, isn't it? And as for electronic devices, um, they're just as easy to steal as a wallet, aren't they? Why? Why would easier? It, uh, yeah, because people walk around like this with the phones, and the, the people are so damn careless with the phones. I've lost count of the times I've seen people sat at a table in a pub, and you know what it's like—they all get their phones out and put them all on the table, and then they all bugger off outside for a smoke, and they just leave all the phones there. You know, you like three or four grand's worth of phones sat on a pub table and nobody gives a damn. But that phone probably contains their entire life. Mm. You know, people are so careless with them. Good. Oh, I've got security on my phone. But they just leave it in a crowded pub on the table while they go to the toilet. It, it's bonkers. Um, so for me, yeah, I can see the push for a cashless society because... It's going to be good for them in some ways, but uh, I really don't want any part of it. I try and deal as much in cash as I can. When I when I can't um, trade with someone, either a favour for a favour or uh, do some sort of a swap, then I'd rather use promissory notes than than anything else. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and and you're right. You're right. Oh, Mahatma says Giles Brandreth. I don't know what he means by that, but I'm sure it'll piss Mithrin off because he hates him. He thinks he's responsible for all the evils of the world, Giles Brandreth. But it, it's them jumpers, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> yeah, have you ever been given any like that for Christmas? Yeah, I've got a couple now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I managed to get rid of mine years ago, but yeah, they, they are embarrassing. Please explain, Giles Brandreth. I think he's Tory. <laughs> no, he's he's just an annoying prick, isn't he? <laughs> Giles Brandreth. Mm. Yes, and if Giles would like a right to reply, then obviously we'd. I'll do, well, maybe not, but yeah, we we'll we'll say that we would because we know we won't listen. Mm. Well, we hope you don't listen anyway. Yeah, Giles, if you're listening, don't, please. Don't. Yeah. Fucking don't. Just don't anymore. <laughs> All right, Giles. Off you fuck. Go on. Fuck off back to fucking Tory party. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, right, we've got, what, we've got about a quarter of an hour left before we play some songs. So, mm, I suppose it's this point... Uh, yeah, I've got a little bit of an announcement to make. I'll make it. I don't. I don't think it will go on quite till the end, but I think we'll uh, find something to fill in with. Um, I've now been doing this just coming up three years now, and it's been a hell of a ride. Um, three years ago, when I started doing this, I spent six days and about 18 hours of every week staring at the four walls of my flat thinking Jesus Christ is that the rest of my life and then some strange bloke from Manchester came up with the idea that I should help him out with a radio show and I did and kind of the rest of it, I suppose, is all laid out on the website, really. But uh, it's been an amazing time. And I've just found that as, as, as it's grown and grown, it's got more and more work. And I feel that, for me, I need to take a bit of a break. I've had, you know, I've had this three years. I've really enjoyed it. I mean... All of you people that is listening, I thank you for listening from the bottom of my heart. 
and all of the, all of you that have got in contact with us and and sent us messages and those of you that join in the chat room it's brilliant i'm not quitting i'm taking some time off because um as you we've probably mentioned a few times on air we've now got a grandson he's a year old and we're spending three days a week looking after him uh, neither me nor me other half are in the best of health so we've kind of got to keep ourselves um perhaps step back a little bit take things a bit easier because uh, um people have been noticing i've been losing a lot of weight lately and quite frankly i really don't want to completely disappear so gonna step off the gas a bit i'll kind of be hanging about in the background and uh, helping jason out aid out best i can and anybody else but uh, so from tonight forward um jason's gonna be holding the fort for me I hope you're okay with that jace absolutely andy listen i i always told you that um no matter you know what whatever you needed if you needed to take time off no no matter how long then uh, you just do it dude it's it, you've got to do what's best for you man oh, that's and, it, man. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate that and and i you know all the all the guys that we we've been working with there's i mean it probably aids the other one that i see the most because i produce for him every monday but uh aid then we've got tony who kind of was a big part of starting raconteurs news and then we've got jack who's um jack's doing his own show he's always helping out other people then we've got nick nomic nick's getting back on the air a bit now which i'm really pleased to see nick's fantastic behind the scenes with his coding and his linux works we've got so many guys helping out uh such a great team it, i've really been proud to be a part of that and um I'm still going to try and be a part of it, but perhaps in just a bit smaller way, yeah. Yeah, and we all appreciate that. We all appreciate that you need time off from time to time. Um, so, uh, I'll tell you what you've got to do, right? Mm -hmm. You've got about 15 minutes left on this show. So, um, if you're, like, you know, going to step to one side, you need to... Gives this last little bit of 15 minutes with your insights. My insights. <clears throat> well, I'd say one thing I've learned, and and it, it seems to be a lesson that, that keeps, seems to be coming to an awful lot of people, is that when the world does seem like is closing in around you and it's all black that it's not the end but you kind of you, your own mind is 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 bringing it to an end what you need to do if you can is to find something to focus on and uh, if you can help someone who's not in as good a place as you are that that's that brings its own rewards. I mean, um, something that, that, that really makes this worthwhile is when you meet people face to face and they say, oh, that show you did about X, Y, Z, whether it's Rick Simpson, Andrew Fletcher, um, Valerie, um, or uh, do the Dr. Sarah Myhill, all of those shows that, that, We've had people come up and say, oh, that really helped me. Um, and that alone makes it all worthwhile. You know, it's better than any any money, any sort of payment that you could ever get. So, yeah, helping people, I think, is an, an amazing thing. But also I've learned that to help others, you need to kind of get your own shit together first. And I kind of knew that instinctively, but really I've got to thank you for voicing that. And that, that's really why I, you know, I'm taking this bit of a break now because we are helping others. There's, there's a few things that we do that don't go out on the air. Um, you know, that's neither here nor there, but those things, we're going to continue to do what we can and what we can't do 
will have to, you know, other people will have to step in and do the helping. But um, I've also learned that it's kind of weird how this has all happened. I mean, I, I kind of, I knew there was, there was going to be a, a point in my life I was either going to die fairly quickly or there was going to be something happening in my life where it, it suddenly did seem worthwhile. And, it, yeah, it, it's it's come along. And I've, the people that I've met along the way have just been astonishing. You know, to, to, to count you and Tony as my friends and Jack and Nick and and Doc and uh, Doc Rock. I forgot to mention Doc with Autonomous, but Doc's incredible. Um, and the work that he's doing to help his local community, just amazing. Um, but also some of the guests that I've made contact with and, and are now classed as friends, people like Rick Simpson, Ricky Dwyer, um, Rob, Rob Alford, who was on last night. One of the most amazing brains that I've come across. Uh, to some people's minds, he's maybe a bit uncouth. I would say you call people like that rough diamonds and he really is love Rob to bits but those people that you meet they they can mean so much to you but occasionally you'll get some people in your circle and and suddenly they'll just drop away and when when that starts to happen or when it first happens can be really upsetting when it first happened to us knocked us for six for a while and then it happened again and again and again and I don't know why these people have drifted away I don't know whether they've changed we've changed a combination of the both or it's in the water or the stars or whatever you've not changed brother <laughs> but those people that you lose it starts to hurt because you, you really thought they were going to be friends for life. But when it's happened a couple of times, you think, oh, OK, this is a part of some bigger plan. And, and right now, I'm at a stage where I really, really do value the friends that I have got. And I'm really grateful for that. And I just want to say it's, it's been such a fabulous time. Uh, I'll be honest I don't think I'm going to miss presenting radio shows for a little while but I hope I do and when I do that's probably when I'll come back you will yeah well that, will. That, that's, that's why I'm not you will do and, 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 and listen do, you take as much time as you want I'll, st I'll still be here <clears throat> yeah well you say I ne one of the my dad didn't teach me that many valuable lessons, but one of them he did was always leave the door open behind you in case you want to get out. Yeah. And I, I try and make a point of not closing doors or burning bridges, and that's that's exactly why I haven't said, look, I've had a belly full of this shit, I'm off. I. It, it's been an amazing ride, and I can see that, and I can see when I've, stepped back from it a while and had a bit of a breather and chilled me beans out I'm going to want to be back at it and I'm really looking forward to feeling like that but uh, I'm going to enjoy my break, I'm going to spend time with my wise woman and uh, she's having a shower at the minute but uh, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying that uh, I know uh, there's one or two out there that are missing her because she used to do a show with Tam but uh, she still loves you all and she still thinks about you. She's just got to take some time for herself as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think you can give the 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 um, you can give it right back to her. We we all miss her as well, and we're going to miss you as well, to uh, Tony. For God's sake, <laughs> <laughs> we'll miss Tony anyway. Have you just oh, turned into Diddy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're going to miss you, Andy, especially me. I mean, for God's sake, I'm going to have to be on a Tuesday going, hello, oh, welcome to Raconteur's News. It's just Jason here on his own doing, you know, nothing. 
it, it, we're going to miss you. And, uh, well... You might find it's uh, more enjoyable without having to remind me to unmute my mic every week. Uh, well, I might do, <laughs> but I, d- I doubt it. I doubt it. It's, it's always good having you there. You're like a like a, a an anchor, a beacon sort of thing, you know. So that... Anyway, that's enough of the arse kissing. Yeah. It, okay. We're, um, we're not Richie Allen, are we? No, 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 no. We don't blow smoke up each other's... Um, yeah, we just uh, give a quick rundown of what's coming up. We've got um, we've got Doc Rock on Thursday night, and then nothing on a Friday. Oh, we we've got um, uh, Banwo's now showing on a Friday night. That's the night after Ben goes live. Hospital Porters against the New World Order. Ben covers a lot of um, UFO and paranormal subjects, so if that's your bag, have a listen. Um, and we were also restreaming his third rail radio. His, his new radio station is started up with um, a couple of other guys, and I've had a little listen to that, and it sounds pretty cool stuff. I'm not quite sure when that's going out at the minute. Then we've got Mark Winders and Tony on a Sunday night. Uh, they, they cover some good topics. And then we've got Aid on a Monday with Raconteurs 2. I know he's got Pippa King on this week and she's going to be talking about smart cities or not and the, uh, the problems that they've had rolling out the smart city agenda in Glasgow. And then uh, after that, we've got some bloke called Jason back on Tuesday with Raconteurs News, 8 till 10. And next week, I'm reliably informed, we've got Not Dr. Tamara back at 10 o'clock with Happy Hour. So that's what's coming up for the next week on Raconteur's News. And unless you've got anything further, I suggest we wind it up with a bit of music, Jase. Yep, good enough for me. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. Uh, Have a good time. Take it easy, Andy. Going to miss you, baby. Yeah, and I'll miss you all. And if you ever see me about anywhere, please do come up and say hello. It's always great to meet listeners. Thanks, folks, and good night.